Okay. All right, we're starting with an announcement. Uh, so there was some confusion about where we're going to hold the final exam, I mean, not the final project presentation, and where. And that's all now, uh, just, it's all reduced, so we're going to hold it here, um, regular class period time, so there's no confusion about what to do next week. Just come here Monday and Wednesday, and you'll be doing your final project presentations. You should have seen the Piazza Post with um, the six spotlights. Everyone else does Blitz Talks, and it's going to be exciting, so all of you, well, I actually require to come, so I was going to encourage you to come, but otherwise you would, you know, not give a presentation and lose points. Um, and make sure to send your slides to Jisoo and, and Sashank, your TAs, two of your TAs, by Sunday night. If you don't have your slides to them, then you might not even have them loaded for the project um, presentation period. So it's really important you give them your slides by Sunday night. Maybe even a bit earlier, because they have to put it all together and uh -huh. maybe Sunday afternoon or something. Sure. Let's say Sunday 5 p.m. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, because they have to get all the PDFs together, and there's always like some problem, and you know, you, you got to give the TAs a break here. Also, make sure you show up on time, because it's going to be really, really tight. That's true. Yeah. It's going to be very tight. So it's important to start on time next week. Um, they will, there will be coffee and cookies probably to make a real conference. So <laughs> leave a little bit of room after your lunch for that. Um, but we, we, we really have to start on time. All right. Is the Sunday deadline for everyone or just for the Monday? Everyone. Okay. Yeah. It's only a few slides. <laughs> All right, so today is the last regular lecture, and we've saved the most controversial for the end. This is sort of like, you know how you see a movie or TV show where the last episode, it turns out it was all a dream. And that's what this is going to be like. And uh, there is a lot of opinion here, so I want to make clear this is my opinion. I'm not claiming anybody else shares my opinion, necessarily. And it's about a problem that I think has become uh, somewhat uh, a pervasive in statistics and machine learning. I drew it as, as a graph. Let me explain this graph. So this stylized graph starts around 1900 and goes to today. And going back to 1900, well, there was no machine learning. There was only statistics. <laughs> <laughs> and what I'm drawing here is what I'm calling the gap, the gap between what people who are writing theoretical papers are doing and what people who are doing practice, who are actually analyzing data. And so back in those days, it was people like Fisher and Pearson and so on. And they were writing th theoretical papers about statistics, but they were engaged every day in doing real uh, applied scientific work. That's what motivated them. That's why they were developing these tools. And then around the 20s, and I, I'm being a little bit loose about the dates, but. Uh, this is the this is like a, a gap now between what the theoreticians were doing and what the the applied people were doing in the sense that people were proving things now about various statistical procedures that had a lot of assumptions and the, but the data they were analyzing didn't necessarily satisfy those assumptions but that's okay the gap wasn't so big maybe I shouldn't have drawn it quite this big <clears throat> then I think it kind of went down a bit um, it got kind of bad for a while, especially maybe, I don't know, I'm going to say in the 50s and 60s when people were doing very formal decision theory. And I would say that the people doing the most theoretical work were a little bit disengaged from everyday statistical practice. And conversely, the people doing applied work perhaps weren't following all the statistical theory, but there were still pretty good connections. And then it got better, I think, because just people got more and more, uh, there was more and more scientific data around and people got more and more involved in it. And then, all of a sudden, the problem of d bigger than n hit. We have more dimensions and data and sparsity and all that stuff took off. And then I think this happened, <clears throat> okay? And I think we're actually at a dangerous point. I, I actually worry about this a lot, which is that I think when we're doing theory, we're making a lot of assumptions to prove things because we've all been trained with ideas that were invented back here. And we're trying to make our procedures look like they did in 1920. And to do that, like say regression, 
You say, well, we write down what we want to happen, and they say, well, what assumptions do we need to make that happen? So we just put those assumptions down. And I'm guilty of this, too, so I'm including myself in here. Um, and so what's happened is there's this very large uh, body of work now in both machine learning and statistics that's very interesting theory, but built on really, really, really fragile assumptions. And on the other hand, there's people like doing genomics and things like that who are using these procedures who really don't have the time or interest necessarily to look deeply at the mathematics. And they say, well, the theory guys proved this works, so I'm going to go ahead and use this to figure out which genes cause cancer. And unfortunately, I think the, there's a huge disconnect. A lot of the people doing the theory have never actually analyzed data and have no feeling for what a realistic assumption is. I won't name names because we're being taped. <coughs> and, uh, <coughs> And conversely, a lot of people th th in practice, they're just, you know, it's become so, the, the theory's become so complicated, it's hard for them to know even what the assumptions are and whether they're realistic or not. And so I think this is actually quite concerning because I think there's a real difference between doing theory and trying to understand what's going on, where you do probably uh, have to make assumptions, versus you're analyzing a data set and you're trying to do scientific things which might actually have big effects on medicine or public policy and so on. So it's not necessarily I'm saying that you shouldn't make assumptions or, or that you should only do theory or only do applications. It's the idea of understanding when, when am I making an assumption that's realistic or when am I making an assumption just so I can kind of figure something out mathematically and figure out what's going on. It's important to have a distinction between this gap between theory and practice. And so, So I want to talk about that. It's going to be kind of a free-ranging, rambling kind of thing, some random thoughts that I've gone on about. Many, some of you have heard me rant about these things before. Um, let's actually skip section two and come back to that, because what I want to do is jump right to what kind of assumptions am I talking about. And I'm, I'm pulling a lot of this from a, a discussion I wrote which I, I referenced there. So I'm going to focus on regression, although it's not only regression this happens, but regression is actually a good example. So what's the typical high dimensional regression theory that you kind of see? If you open up the Annals of Statistics or the Journal of Machine Learning Research or NIPS, and you look at a theoretical paper about prediction, in particular regression, you'll see something like this. You'll see, well, OK. We're going to assume this and a bunch of other things. And now we're going to prove that such and such a method recovers the correct betas and gives me confidence intervals for the betas or whatever. Okay. And the history here, though, is we should go back and say, how, let's take the lasso, which is one of the most important methods created in the, in the last little while. And it came about because we, you know, we were trying to do model selection for these high dimensional problems. And then uh, Rob Tipsharani came up with the idea of doing uh, this L1 penalty, which led to a convex problem. We get a very well-defined solution. But the first paper on it just sort of said, here's a method, and, and people started using it. Then came the, the rush to say, well, OK, let's try to fill in the theory. Let's see, why does this work? That's when the trouble started. It wasn't with the method. It was with when we all started to now try to prove theorems, and it was all a matter of, we know what we want to say about it, so let's make up assumptions that make it work. That was sort of a little bit backwards. What are the kind of assumptions? So, and these assumptions all drive me crazy. <clears throat> so first of all, x fixed. People often treat x fixed, which I've always found to be a strange thing in regression. This comes back from about 19, I don't know, 10 or 20, when people were doing mostly designed experiments. The x's were like, how much fertilizer I was putting on this piece of land. So x was literally fixed. It was something an experimenter chose. That's why x was fixed at first. Um, but when you're, when you're regressing y a disease on x, which is 5,000 genes, there's nothing fixed about 5,000 genes. They're random variables, right? And I remember when I used to first teach uh, our regression class many, many years ago, I would teach fixed x regression, and always some student would say, why is it that y is random and x is fixed? It seems very odd. And I would go, yeah, you're right. It, it just doesn't seem right. It doesn't, to me, it doesn't make any sense to uh, think of x as fixed. But there's deep reasons for not treating x as fixed. So there's a lot of work developed by Jamie Robbins and, 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 uh, and 
Yakov Ritov, which about high dimensional inference, which the, the message of which is the following. For low dimensional inference, it's very appealing to condition on things. This is sort of a history of this in statistics. Conditioning is sort of a good thing. But in high dimensional problems, that's wrong. Everything, you require stronger and stronger assumptions to do things conditionally, or that, that is to treat x as fixed. And they have some very, very nice papers that basically show you must treat x as random in high dimensions, or you're really in big trouble. And so that's a whole other literature that I can't possibly get into. There's a recent paper by Larry Brown and his colleagues in the context of regression where they make a lot of arguments about why you should really, it's important to think about x as being random, not fixed, when you're talking about high dimensional regression. So both from the conceptual point of view, but for many theoretical reasons, it's actually much better to think of x as random, not fixed. The second assumption is this. Why in the world would x be a linear function of, why would y be a linear function of the x's? I mean, that's just insane, right? Y can be any function of the x's. If I think about the, me the mean of y given x, this can be any function in the universe. <clears throat> why would it be linear? Now, you can imagine certain physical systems, or maybe uh, signal processing, or certain you know, situations like that, that are very specialized, where there would be a physical reason why there would be a linear relationship. But most times when you're doing high dimensional regression, there's no reason to think that this would be a linear function. It would be a, a miracle if it was a linear function. So there's you know, something that I emphasized in 705 was the difference between creating a linear predictor, which can be a very useful thing to do, that's different than assuming that the true regression function is linear, that you're describing nature that way. So it's a really important distinction, the difference between assume, using a linear predictor versus actually assuming this model is true. This just, there's no reason to ever assume this is true, and there's no way to check it, not in high dimensions. Another weird assumption to me is that people often assume that this is constant. It doesn't depend on x. Well, <clears throat> let's think about the mean. What if I said the mean of y given x is constant? Let's just assume the mean of y given x is constant. There wouldn't be any regression to do. You'd go, that's insane, right? Why would the variance be constant? If the mean isn't constant, why should the variance be constant? The variance is just the next moment. So um, we don't want to assume that. That's, that's crazy. Uh, <clears throat> epsilon is normal. Nothing's normal, all right? <clears throat> Nothing has a normal distribution, except in textbooks. Beta is sparse. You know, there are cases where sparsity might make sense, where, where you might think that a disease might only depend on a small number of genes. We don't really know that. A lot of, of, of diseases are dependent only on a small number of genes, but it's believed that a lot of, that a lot of diseases depend on of complicated interactions between large numbers of genes. We don't know ahead of time. And we kind of like to think that you know, nature is simple, but that's a hope. It's an assumption. And it may be true sometimes, but it certainly just can't always be assumed to be true. But again, I want to distinguish, though, that there's the assumption that the truth is sparse, which is pretty hard to justify and hard to check, versus I want a sparse predictor, which is a different thing. Then, then you're just choosing a sparse predictor because it's useful to have a sparse predictor. So I'm just worrying about the assumption that the truth is sparse. And now comes the worst one, which is when I look, when I look at the x's in, as a n by d matrix, there's a lot of literature that assumes that this has some sort of, and it goes under different names. There's restricted eigenvalue, incompatibility, incoherence. Uh, basically, it boils down to assuming that the columns of x are pretty close to uncorrelated. Okay, and you can see why you would need that. If x1 and x2, let's say, are highly correlated, you'll never know whether, is it beta 1 that's big or beta 2? There's no way to tell. They're highly correlated. And the funny thing is, when I took regression many, many, many years ago, it was my first regression course, the first day of class, I remember the teacher saying, look, you're gonna, we're going to get data. They're going to be collinear. Everything's going to be correlated. That's what's going to happen all the time. That's, that's why regression is a messy problem. And I worked, by the way, when I was a student in a consulting center for 20 hours a week, every week. That's how I earn money. I never came across a single regression problem where the x's weren't totally correlated all over the place. That's the standard. It's, I've never seen in my life a design matrix where things were close to uncorrelated. 
Okay, that's just not going to happen. And there's one exception again, which is in signal processing. You get, to dis you get to fill in the X matrix yourself. This is called compressed sensing. And the way you fill it in typically is you, fill, you make each entry independent normals. And then you can prove with high probability you get an incoherent matrix. But that should already tell you how special incoherent matrices are, if that's how you have to create them. Real data, you're never going to get anything close to incoherent. It just doesn't happen, OK? So, so what I'm saying is a lot of this stuff is kind of a house of cards. It's all built on these uh, kind of ridiculous assumptions. But that doesn't mean it's hopeless. There's still lots of things you can do. So what I want to talk about now is things that we can do without making all of these assumptions. The things you can't do are things that, first of all, about the betas, because the betas don't even exist. It's not even a linear function. What's the beta? We can, we can sort of deal with that, as we'll see in a few minutes, in a different way. Um, and things like you're going to recover the true betas and things like that, these are all the, the dodgy things. But there are some things you can do without making assumptions, or at least with making very few assumptions. So one of them is, let's go back to the roots of, of the lasso from a predictive point of view. So I, this is what I call uh, the assumption-free lasso. It's not, that, it's not a different lasso. It's just a different interpretation of what's going on. And Ryan actually mentioned uh, during his, some of his lectures some work by Greenstein and Ritoff, which I've referenced here. And this is what I'm going to uh, tell you about right now, which is that if we focus on the lasso or many of these other things in a predictive way, this, then the lasso has wonderful properties without making any assumptions at all, or very few assumptions. Of course, everything relies on some assumptions. The, the most assumption-free thing I know about is called individual sequence prediction, which is at the back of the notes. And whether we'll get there or not, I don't know, because we'll see how things go. Probably not. But that really literally makes, I think, pretty close to zero assumptions. But we're we are going to make some assumptions. We just want to make them as weak as possible. So here's the idea. Um, we're going back to our usual regression framework. So I am going to make an assumption, which is that these are iid. But I'm treating the x's as random. But that's it. I'm not going to assume linearity. I'm not going to assume anything about the variance. I'm not going to assume any design, things about the design matrix or anything like that. I am, in the proof I'm about to do, I'm going to assume that x's and y's are bounded. That's, that's a technical assumption. It's actually not needed. It just makes the proof one line long. OK, so we could get rid of that assumption as well. But that's, that one is, is more about just keeping the math simple. It's not uh, so crucial. But it, I'm not going to assume linearity or incoherence or anything like that. OK, so the idea is I'm going to show you that the lasso gives you, in some sense, an optimal sparse linear predictor. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to allow the true regression function to be arbitrary. But we're going to take the point of view is that, nevertheless, I can still use a linear function to do predictions. So we're going to look at linear predictors, which are, of course, things like this. And what I want to do is consider the, I'll define the predictive risk. I think this is consistent with how Ryan did it, which is simply, here I'm viewing x and y as a new pair. So I get a new pair x and y. And if I take a particular beta, this is the predictive risk. So that's perfectly well defined without assuming anything about the uh, regression function. All right. So I can't talk about a true beta because I'm not assuming linearity. But I can still talk about what the best linear sparse predictor is. And I'm going to use the notion of L1 sparsity. So. Let's look at, let's let beta star be the, I'll call it the best linear sparse predictor, by which I mean it minimizes R of beta subject to the L1 norm being less than some number. So we're assuming that it makes sense to describe sparsity with the L1 norm here, which hopefully by now you've seen enough of that, that this is some measure of, of sparsity. All right, so in other words, if this is the set of betas, we're finding some beta star. 
let's say it's this one. This is an oracle. We don't know what this is. But this is the beta star, which minimizes the predictive risk and satisfies our sparsity constraint. So we're calling this the best sparse linear predictor. Okay. And uh, what is the lasso? Well, the lasso is just the sample version of that. Right, if I minimize the training error, and I'm writing it in the form where we restrict the norm as opposed to adding lambda plus the penalty. We know that those two paths are equivalent. So I'm minimizing this overall beta 1 less than some constant, where r hat's just the training error. That's the lasso. That's what you're doing when you're doing the lasso. Again, you're probably used to doing it by taking this and adding a penalty, but you know you can always rewrite it this way, that we're just going to minimize the training error subject to a constraint. So this is what the lasso is doing, and this is the population version. What can we say about that? Well, actually, with very little effort now, I'm going to show you that we're going to, that, that this, uh, that the sample version does very well, that the prediction risk of beta hat, I'm going to show you, with high probability, is less than the risk of the best linear predictor, plus some constants That's the sparsity level over n. And there's a typo there that p should be d. So with probability at least 1 minus delta, the risk of the lasso is a bit bigger than the risk of the best linear predictor. And this is, a, again, an assumption-free result. We're not going to use any assumptions to prove this. And the proof's really simple, which is also a nice feature. It does depend on, of course, the sparsity level. So if the sparsity level gets too big, this will start to get big. Notice that the dimension only comes in logarithmically. So this is kind of explaining why the lasso works in some sense, why you can do high dimensional regression this way. It's kind of a distribution-free explanation of the lasso. All right, so um, let's use what we've done in class to prove this. And it's only a few lines long, and we're just going to use basic concentration of measure to prove this result. So I'm, I'm citing here Greenstein and Ridoff, but actually their, their paper is actually just a, an expansion of an earlier paper by Nemirovsky and uh, Juditsky, where if you look back at that paper, it's really ahead of, of its time because the paper goes back quite a ways. And if you look at the paper, it's not even obvious it's about the same problem. It's kind of written in a different notation, different language. But this is actually what they, what they prove. And it looks like this. So here's the proof. <clears throat> I'm going to do it maybe on one board. So first of all, I just want to introduce a bit of notation. I'm going to call the pair x, y, we'll call that z. And let's let sigma be the, co the covariance matrix of z, so the true covariance matrix. And then there'll be a sample covariance matrix. And here's a little trick just to make things notationally a little bit easier, which is um, I'm going to rewrite beta. So I'm going to take beta, but I want to rewrite it now. So we have beta 1, beta 2 up to beta d. I'm going to just put a minus 1 in the first coordinate. I'm going to add an extra coordinate, which is always minus 1. And the reason why I'm doing that is because then you can see if you look at what this is, this, think of this as, you know, this is part of z, and this is the first coordinate of z, because z consists of y and x. And think of this now as m the first beta. There's a minus 1 here, and then there's the rest of beta here. This is just a quadratic form. In other words, once I, write, once I do that, I can rewrite the risk to be this. It's just this quadratic form. Right, just rewrite this as, this is just z transpose beta once I enlarge beta to put a minus 1. And then if I square it and take the expected value, I get this. 
That's just another way, a convenient way to write the predictive risk. And similarly, the, the empirical risk that you're minimizing when you do the lasso is just substituting this in. It's just putting in the sample version. OK, so now let's just do the usual trick. Remember when we did the VC stuff and everything? The first step was always to compare the empirical and the true risk. That was always the key step that allowed us to show what we wanted to show. And it's the same here, but here we don't, it turns out we don't need any sort of fancy VC theory or anything like that, just because everything's either linear or quadratic, so it simplifies everything. So what ends up happening, let's just write it out. Let's just look at, for any beta, let's look at the difference between the empirical risk and the true risk. So if I just subtract these, that's just beta transpose sigma hat minus sigma beta, right? Actually, let's write out, this is a double sum. Actually, let's, let's bring the absolute value on the inside. So this is a double sum over j and k, and this will be beta j, beta k, and then it's sigma jk minus sigma jk. OK, I just, I just wrote out what this is. It's a quadratic form, so it's a double sum. But now watch this. <clears throat> let's, let's call the maximum difference over the entire matrix. I think, did I give it a name? I think I called it delta somewhere. Yeah, <clears throat> let's call the maximum of this over all entries delta. So I'm going to pull that out. What am I left with when I pull this out? I just, it break, I get a separable sum, and it's the L1 norm twice, right? It's L squared. See how the L1 norm naturally comes into this. OK, but what's this thing? Well, think about what every entry is. Every entry is just a sample covariance minus a true covariance. That's an average minus its expected value. And so we know we could, for each entry in that matrix, we could do Hoefting's inequality and then take the union bound over the whole matrix. So in other words, yeah, let me go onto this board. The probability that the maximum is bigger than epsilon, let's say, is less than or equal to, I'm just going to take the union over the whole matrix, so there's d squared elements. In fact, there's, I guess there's fewer, really, because there's you know, symmetry. But let's say d squared. And then each one of these, I just do Hoefting's inequality. It's just an average minus its expected value. See, if I didn't make it bounded, we would just use a different inequality. So that's why I made it bounded, just so I could use Hoefting. So Hoefting's inequality gives e to the minus n, and there's some constant depending on what range x and y can take, OK? And so what have we got? If I, I'm going to do the usual trick, I want to set this to be equal to delta. And then with probability at least 1 minus delta, if I solve for epsilon here, I get epsilon is less than 1 over n times a constant log 2d over delta. <clears throat> so let me go back and put this in. That's what I needed was a bound here, right? So with probability at least 1 minus delta, this difference, and notice that this is true for any beta in this L1 ball. This is uniform automatically. So what we've actually shown is that the soup for all these L1 sparse vectors of R beta minus R beta is less than or equal to this thing times L squared. Let's call this epsilon n. And now we do, finally, we do the trick we did when we were doing proving things about k-means or about classifiers and so on, which is to take the risk 
of, well, first of all, we're talking about the risk of the best one, which is by definition smaller than any one, so that's certainly smaller than the risk of the lasso estimator, which is beta hat. And now we do that trick where I can trade between r and r hat as long as I add an epsilon n. So this is all with probability at least 1 minus delta. I can switch r to r hat. Now I use the fact that beta hat minimizes r hat. That's the one you got from the algorithm. So if I put in beta star again, it can only get bigger. And then I switch back from r hat to r at the expense of another epsilon. And we're done. So to me, this is one of the most important theorems about the lasso. It makes, other than IID, it really makes no assumptions. And it's also much easier to prove, by the way, than all those other complicated theorems. <clears throat> and what is it saying? It's saying that you're actually finding, with high probability, something close to the best sparse linear predictor. So that's an example to me of a result that shows good things happen, and we don't have to make all those assumptions. OK, any questions about that? The important thing here is we're thinking really about the predictive properties, just how well are we predicting. We're not thinking too much about what the betas mean. Okay. It turns out, by the way, you might wonder, how about other methods? There's a paper by uh, Ron DeVore, Albert Cohen, and, and, and Andrew Barron in, I forget what year it is, but maybe the late 90s or early 2000s, that shows exactly the same thing for forward stepwise regression. Almost the same bound. The proof turns out to be a lot more complicated. One of the nice things about the lasso is that the, because of the simple form of, of the estimator and the risk and everything, everything just uh, works out easy because we're, we're minimizing over a very simple set. The greedy nature of forward stepwise just makes the proof more complicated, but it's the same bound. And in fact, let me tell you that this is minimax optimal. So what is this saying? We're, how close are we to the optimal risk? Well, we're about 1 over root n away. And it turns out you can't improve on that without making extra assumptions. So both forward stepwise and lasso are rate optimal in terms of predictive risk in these sense of sort of best sparse predictors and so on. OK? All right. So that's our first example. Let me just tie my shoelace here before I trip. Uh, that's our first example of how you can say useful things without drinking the Kool-Aid. Okay. Any questions? I want to stir up a bit of controversy here. I want someone to argue with me. <laughs> All right. Keep going. Then, I'll, then this one maybe will make you a little bit more riled up, which is, Sometimes we don't just want to predict. We want to say something about, I've picked these 25 genes. I'm going to predict well now thanks to a theorem like this. But how important was gene 5? How important is gene 8? And that kind of thing. That's a more inferential type of a question. So how are we going to do that if we're not making all these assumptions? What does it even mean to say how important is gene 5 when we're, when we, when we're not even assuming the betas have any sort of meaning? Well. There are ways to do inference about variable importance. And uh, one of the easiest ways is sample splitting. OK, so I'm going to talk about sample splitting. So I'm assuming that I want to do some sort of prediction, but also some sort of inference again about, about how important the variables are. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our data again. And for convenience, let me assume that the number of data points is even. And I'll call the sample size now 2n. And uh, what I'm going to do is randomly split the data into two pieces. So the first part, and I'm just going to take them to be equal. There's nothing special about equal except that that's simple. So the first part is going to have n data points. And the second part will also have n data points. Let me make sure I stick to the notation. 
did I call them? Yeah, I guess D1, D2. So I'll call this D2. Um, maybe I'll just put primes here or something to distinguish them from the So on the first half of the data, I'm going to use that to do model selection. So I'm, let's, to have a concrete example, we're trying to predict a disease, say Y, based on X, which is a bunch of genes, let's say 5,000 genes. And you're going to run your favorite procedure. Maybe it's going to be the lasso with some sort of cross-validation, or it's forward stepwise, or LARS, or whatever, OK? Could be non-parametric and so on. Let's stick to linear things for now. So you. You run some sort of model selection procedure here. And so what's going to come out is a set of variables, which we'll assume is not too large. Maybe those are the best 20 genes or something like that. All right, good. So now we have we've done the model selection part. Now we're going to look, use the rest of the data to try to answer the inferential question, which is I've picked out the genes in here. I want to use this part of the data to do inference. And the reason why I'm splitting it is because it's very, very difficult to use the same data to choose the genes and then do inference about them for obvious reasons, right? Because you're, it's going to be biased now. And I have to decide now how am I going to measure the importance of each variable. So let's suppose that once I give you those genes, we're going to use a linear predictor again. We're not going to assume the truth is linear, but we are going to use a linear predictor. So I don't know, let's say on the second half of the data, I'll do, uh, let's write it like this. Uh, yeah, sort of beta. I'll do, say, least squares on the genes that I've selected. Now, there's, to ask how important for prediction are the different things that I've uh, chosen, there are various ways to assess that. And in fact, in the notes, I talk about several of them. But I'm going to just pick a particularly simple one that's, that's um, close to what you're used to from linear regression, which is what's called the projection parameter. Which is simply, I'll call it beta of s, what is the best linear predictor of y based on the variables of s. Right? So in other words, what is, it's really just asking what is beta hat of s estimating. So if I, if I were to look at which beta minimizes the risk, but now I'm talking about only using those variables that I've selected, there's a best linear predictor. Right? It's the thing that minimizes this. And of course, that's what this is estimating. The point here, again, is that we're not assuming that the true model is linear, we're, but we can still talk about what's the best linear predictor based on these variables. So this would be the best linear predictor based on those variables. And so a natural thing to ask is, you know, let's look at the size of these things and which ones are big, which ones are small, which ones are significant. You know, we can still do inference about this, even though the true function is not assumed to be linear. Because we've separated the, the model selection process from the inference process, it's as if we're do, we have a fresh start here. There's no bias in this. Even though this subset of variables, for example, is random, the inferences here now can be carried out as if we hadn't done model selection. And in particular, you could just do, say, the, the bootstrap would be a simple thing to do. So how would we do the bootstrap? We would do it the way we usually do it so we could We'd be interested in, and for example, we could do this. We'd be interested in, ideally, we'd like to know, let's say, the distribution of the maximum difference between the beta hats and the true projection parameters. And we don't know that, but we can just use the second half of the data, which hasn't been infected with the model selection procedure. And just do the bootstrap so we can approximate this, say, 1 over b 
screwed in. These would just be bootstrap replications. And so we'd get a, a bootstrap approximation to this distribution. And in particular, we'd confine the, say, the alpha level cutoff. And then what would happen is if you take beta hat, which is a vector, and add and subtract that t alpha over root n, you now have a valid confidence interval for those projection parameters. This is conditional on having selected those variables. I've chosen genes 1, 8, and 73, and now I'm telling you the best linear predictor on those three genes has some vector beta, and we now have a confidence, a valid confidence set. So it's really simple. And it doesn't make a million assumptions. There are a lot of papers right now that try to do this inferential procedure without splitting the data. And I don't mean to be critical, but they do have a lot of assumptions built into them. Whereas there's, notice we haven't assumed anything with the design matrix. We haven't assumed linearity, normality, nothing like that. But some people, oh, Kevin, yes. Ah, so that's a great, that's the question I was hoping somebody asked. Am I losing anything by splitting it? So they do get more power if their assumptions are correct. If the assumptions fail, this is still correct, and those things are meaningless now. And in fact, I'm going to give you a quasi-theorem, which I haven't proved yet, but I'm pretty sure I can prove. Ryan might give me a hard time about this, which is I'm going to claim that the following is true. If we want to do this purely non-parametrically in a distribution-free way with no assumptions, I claim you're not losing anything by splitting the data. So here's my claim. <clears throat> if, if suppose, just to have a concrete, uh, just to have a concrete example, let's say you do k steps of forward stepwise regression. I'm pretty sure I can prove the following. It's dangerous to say that when you're being taped, because now I'm going to have to do this in this summer. But <clears throat> it's OK. Ryan and I are going to do this together. So, <clears throat> This procedure that I just described, how big is, is the confidence rectangle? The answer is the width of this interval turns out to be um, log of order log k over root n. And what's the actual coverage? I'm claiming it's 1 minus alpha, but there's actually an error because the bootstrap is an asymptotic procedure. And the error turns out to be also of order log k over root n. So that's with splitting. What if I didn't split the data? What if I tried to use the data to do model selection and inference simultaneously? But I don't make all those assumptions. What's the best I can do? And here's my claim, which this part, proving this part's easy. Proving the next part uh, ha is yet to be done. So it should really be called a conjecture. It's just that I'm pretty sure it's true. Which is with, with, with no, without splitting and without assumptions, with no splitting, I believe that here's what I think happens. This is k log d over n. That's the size. Look at that, k over n versus log k over n. So you're, not, you're actually losing by not splitting. But what's worse is the accuracy behaves like k log d over n to the 1 sixth, which is much, much worse. OK, so maybe I'll put quotes to indicate it hasn't been proved yet, <clears throat> but I'm pretty sure that's true. So Kevin's reaction, though, is, is because we've trained him so well as a statistician already, is every statistician hates what I'm saying. I'm the only statistician who likes data splitting because they all say you're wasting data. It's very inefficient and so on. But see, they're stuck in the 1950s thinking about all these assumptions being true and what they were taught from Lehman's book and, and all this stuff. They haven't freed their minds yet from <laughs> the shackles of assumptions. So to play the devil's advocate, uh, this, this would be a worse case, for example, Right. I'm talking about fully non-parametric. Yeah, so this could be, and this is also, in that setting, the, the, the largest, uh, say, width of the 
rectangle over the worst distribution there. So it's unclear what happens right somewhere in between. This, this result might be saying that in, in the very worst case, no splitting looks a lot worse, but they deviate from a parametric model or in some slight amount, it's yeah. unclear what's going to happen. It, it, Ryan has a good point. So if this is the set of all distributions, and if this is the set of these distributions that satisfy all these assumptions, I'm talking about comparing something which works all over, you know, over everything versus the ones that only hold in the assumptions. But what happens if your assumptions are approximately correct? So we don't know the answer to that. That's unexplored territory. However, I, uh, th that raises another question, which is uh, what I like to call fragility, which is another problem, <clears throat> which is, so this, this stuff is, is pretty much distribution free. A lot of the current methods for doing inference, they have results like the following. They'll say that, okay, I've got a confidence set under all of those assumptions that's much smaller than what I just said. So the probability that beta is in here, and that converges to 1 minus alpha. So there's, there's some, a lot of papers now in the literature about this. Unfortunately, as far as I know, all the current ones that work for high dimensional regression have the following property, which, uh, so I call this fragility, which is the following. So here's, you know, here's a distribution P where these assumptions hold. And let's, let's, uh, let's consider what happens if I violate the assumptions a little bit. So let's look at the probability, let's say, under Q, where the distance between P and Q, and I'll explain what I mean by distance, is, is about 1 over n, very close. Then another thing that I'm pretty sure, I haven't written down the proof yet, but this now, I believe, goes to 0. So let me explain what I'm talking about here. I'm saying that here's P. And this gets to the section that I skipped over earlier, which is what I, what I called empirical indis indistinguishability. This goes back to Lacan and to some papers by David Donahoe in the 80s, which is, when can I tell two distributions apart? So let me go back now to that. Um, let's take a simple situation. Suppose, first of all, I just have a distribution P and a distribution Q. Suppose I only had one observation. And I ask you, is it possible to ever tell P and Q apart? Well, one way of saying that is to say, if I tried to do a hypothesis test, say at level alpha, would there be any test of level alpha that has non-trivial power? You want the power to be a lot more than alpha, right? Because you could always just flip a coin with probability of heads being alpha and get a test that has power alpha and type 1 error alpha, which would be pretty useless. So you want the if type 1 error to be alpha, you like the power to be in your 1 for these things to be useful. And what Lacombe, one of Lacombe's theorem says is that if the total variation distance, which is, I'll remind you, soup of, if this is, less than or equal to epsilon, then they're indistinguishable in the sense that if I have any test for these with type 1 error alpha, then the power is at most alpha plus, I think, epsilon over 2, is it? Yeah, <clears throat> epsilon over 2, which is basically alpha. What that's just saying is if two distributions are close in total variation distance, they're indistinguishable. No test is ever going to tell them apart. Now that's based on one observation. What happens in n observations is that if the total variation distance between p and q is less than or equal to one, say, some constant times 1 over n, but we'll just say 1 over n, then again we have the same situation. Let's say this is epsilon over n. Then any, any test with type 1 error alpha has essentially the same power. In other words, if I have two distributions which are about 1 over n apart in total variation distance, and there's lots of other distances you can use, you're never going to be able to tell them apart. They're empirically indistinguishable. 
But what that means is if you're considering P to be a valid model for your data, and if Q is empirically indistinguishable, you should also consider Q to be a, a perfectly valid explanation of your data. And so what I'm doing here is I'm saying if I take P where some of these confidence procedures work, and if I consider Qs, which are empirically indistinguishable, no tests would ever tell them apart, all of a sudden the coverage goes from 1 minus alpha to 0. And I'm pretty sure that's true of all the current procedures. So again, I'll put quotes because I haven't really proved this, but I'm pretty sure it's true. They're fragile. In fact, here's a good test for you when you write a paper. When you prove that you have some new cool procedure, check and see if this, what happens if you perturb the distribution by a little bit. And make sure that it still has good properties. Or in other words, make sure it's robust, that a small perturbation to the distribution doesn't completely destroy the uh, properties of the procedure. So yeah, a lot of the current stuff has this fragility or lack of robustness property. OK, so now we've seen um, two procedures, though, that are, are robust and are distribution free or, or, or approximately distribution free, which are um, just doing purely predictive inference with the lasso and data splitting inference. Now, let's see, in the time left, I can only cover a few things. Maybe I will talk about, uh, I was, another thing we've already talked about earlier, which is mentioned here, is something I called conformal inference, which was a way of doing prediction. I did talk about that, didn't I, briefly? It's, 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 it's something I talked about briefly. Did I do it in this class? Yeah. And it's, it, it's also a distribution-free way of doing uh, predictive inference. But I think what I'm going to jump ahead to is individual sequence prediction. Okay? So that's page 12. Okay, so individual sequence prediction is a type of online learning. And I, I have to admit, I'm not an expert on online learning. Even though I think it's a very important topic, it's just not something I'm very familiar with. This is only one small part of online learning. But what I, the reason why I want to mention it here is because it's just a very interesting example of something where there's actually rigorous results and there's no assumptions. Okay? And it works like this. So if you've never seen this before, I have to tell you this is kind of surprising because you think, you think it's almost impossible to do anything in this situation. Because we're not going to make any assumptions. We're not even going to assume anything's drawn randomly. This is going to be a purely deterministic problem. The interesting thing is that the theorem, if we have time to prove it, we'll see, does use, though, probabilistic tools. In particular, it uses, again, uh, you know, probability inequalities that we've used throughout the course. So we convert things into a kind of probabilistic framework to prove things, even though there is no uh, probability going on. So here's how individual sequence prediction works. Is the idea is very simple. We're, we're going to predict every day. So this could be predicting the weather, predicting a stock, predicting whether you're going to you know, click on something, whatever. So we'll imagine we have y1, y2. Let's just think of this as, you know, just to keep it simple, it's either sunny or not every single day. And your goal always, so we'll just take it to be 0, 1. It doesn't have to be 0, 1. And your goal is just to, to as we go along every day, you have to make a new prediction. But we're not going to assume the y's are random. They could be random. But there could be an adversary playing against you, which might seem weird for weather prediction, but maybe for stock markets or for advertising online, maybe it's not so weird. But the, the notion of that there could even be an adversary, to me, is not so important for the game theoretic reasons. It's just a way of saying that, again, it's completely distribution free. If, it can, if this is going to work, even if some adversary is picking the Ys, then you're not making any distributional assumptions at all. So it's just a way of saying it's very, very non-parametric. No randomness. So what's going to happen, though, is we're going to have a set of algorithms or estimators or predictors. In this area, they're called experts, which maybe isn't the best uh, terminology. <clears throat> I, I prefer to think of them as algorithms or something. But I, we'll say there's a finite number of algorithms. 
And what these do is they just take in the data and spew out a prediction. So you can just think of these as a bunch of estimators you have lying around. So for example, F1 might say, and well, by the way, we'll let the predictions be between 0 and 1. Even though y is 0, 1, let's just let the predictions be a number between 0 and 1. So F1 might say, take the average of all the y's you've seen so far. Okay? F2 might say, take a weighted average, giving higher weight to more recent things. F3 might say, just take the average of the last 10, you know, whatever. Okay? And so here's the game. We're going to think of it as a game, as a sequential game, is at time t, we're going we're to have seen y up to t minus 1. And you get to see the past. You don't get to see the future, unfortunately. And of course, you can apply your algorithm to the, to the past, too, and see how you know, we get to see the predictions that f1 to fn make on all the past predictions. And now you have to come up with a prediction. And it could be one of these. It could be anything else you want. It could be something else you've dreamed, just dreamed up. So we'll call your prediction a time t piece of t. And now, finally, you find out what the weather is today, or what the stock does today, yt. And then you're going to suffer some loss. So I'll take, this has all been done in great generality, but for, for simplicity, I'm just going to assume that the loss function is just absolute loss. So this is uh, pt minus yt. And that's it. That's the game. It's one of the simplest kind of online games you could play. OK, is the game clear? Rules are clear? All right. And again, don't, you have to get your mind out of thinking about randomness here, because there's nothing necessarily assumed to be random. Now, as we go along, we're going to make mistakes, and we're going to accumulate some loss. So there's the cumulative loss. What did I call that? I called that L. Well, actually, first of all, there's the um, cumulative loss. First of all, for so there's the loss that you're going to make. But you could also ask for each one of your prediction algorithms what loss it makes. So that's what the LJ is. LJ of yn means after n days, what's the average loss that, that the prediction algorithm has made at time t minus yt. Okay. And I forgot to write down yours, but your own predictions are going to have some loss at, at time t. And again, your prediction could be Related to these things could be something else. All right, now how do we judge how well we're doing? What's our goal here? Well, the goal is we're starting with this large set of algorithms. We'd like to do as well as possible as the best algorithm. Okay. Now, of course, if I could look forward in time, I could just run each algorithm and see which one does the best and pick that one, but we don't know that. That's the problem. So by the end of this process, I'd say, okay, how am I going to compare to hindsight, to what I would have done if I'd known ahead of time the best algorithm? So that's the regret. So the regret is defined to be, after n days, what's your cumulative loss or your average loss compared to the best you would have done of all the possible estimators that you could have used? That's, that's how we're going to measure how well we're doing. That's the regret. This is like the excess loss, say, when we're doing you know, classification and so on. But we're going to look at the maximum, and this is the really interesting part, over all vectors y that could have occurred. So usually we're used to doing kind of minimax theory. We're taking a maximum over you know, parameters and there's distributions. Again, there's nothing random. I'm looking over every possible outcome that could have occurred. There's nothing random. And I'm going to look at the maximum regret. 
That's how I'm going to evaluate how well you've done as a predictor at the end of this procedure. And what I'm really interested in is the, the minimax regret, which is just the info for all possible prediction algorithms that you could have thought of, of RNP. Okay, is that clear? So after the game's done, I can say what your regret is. How well did you do relative to the best estimator? And I'm going to look at the worst possible case that could happen, and I want to minimize that. So it's minimax, but there's, again, there's no distributions. There's nothing random here. So what, this seems so unstructured that when you first hear about it, it seems like you can't, how could you ever do anything? How could you ever do well in this? You're taking the inf over the whole sample space, not just the info over some model or some set of distributions. So the remarkable thing is you can say, first of all, a bound on this minimax risk, and you can actually achieve it. That's the really uh, amazing thing, at least when you first see this, it certainly, it certainly amazed me. And so I'm going to tell you, there's many actually different algorithms that, that come close to, to optimal. One of the most common one is to just do some sort of what's called a weighted prediction, which is the following. What we do is, at each time, so let's, let me draw a picture of what's going on here, right? So here's F1, F2, up to Fn. Here's y. Okay, so there's data coming out. You're running these algorithms, which are giving you predictions. But somehow you have to come up with your own predictor also. Right? What we're going to do is assign a weight. This will be weight j at time t minus 1, which is simply proportional to e to the minus gamma times the cumulative loss. Remember, we had the loss of j up to time t. Let's write it this way. So in other words, I look at the cumulative loss of this algorithm, of this estimator, this estimator, this estimator. I take e to the minus n gamma times that loss. So something with a big loss gets a small weight. And I take a weight for each one like this. And then I make them sum up to 1. That's why I wrote proportional to. These are naturally called the uh, exponential weights. And what am I going to use as my predictor? I think you can guess. I'm just going to take an average of these things with those weights. Okay, so I'm going to, my prediction at time t is simply going to be the sum of the weights at that time times the output of each algorithm. Okay, so in other words, I get, I see the past data, I run the algorithm, I get the predictions, and I just take a weighted average giving higher weight to the ones that are doing better. It makes a lot of intuitive sense. And here's the theorem. This is theorem 3, the top of page 13. which says, if I pick gamma in a particular way, so these are, there's two different n's here. n is the number of days we're doing this. Capital N is the number of algorithms we're using. So this particular method only works for finitely many predictors, although there's extensions to infinitely many predictors. Then here's the theorem, is that the loss the cumulative loss you're going to suffer if you use this algorithm minus, minus the, min, the minimum, so this is your regret, is less than or equal to log of n over root 2n. So you're doing very close to what would have been the best predictor or algorithm to use in hindsight. Not only that, but I didn't state it here, but you can show this is very close to optimal. You can't do much better than this. And you can see it's going to zero at rate 1 over root n. OK, so this is one of the simplest uh, versions of this. I mean, there's a lot of questions that would come up, which is how do you extend it to 
other loss functions to infinitely many estimators, you know, and, and so on. So there's all kinds of extensions of this stuff. I picked this particular version because it's one of the oldest ones and it's one of the simplest ones. But what's interesting about it is, again, when you first hear about it, at least I thought, how could you do anything in this problem? I mean, there's really, you know, talk about assumption free. We're not even assuming there's a distribution here. But you can. So you can actually say what's the best you can do, and you can actually come up with a very simple algorithm that comes very close to that the best you can do. And I like this just, if nothing else, as an example, again, of how you can do things with very minimal assumptions. I'm trying to think if we should prove this or talk about something else. Um, Do we want to see the proof or something else? Kevin. I have a question about this. Does this mean I can just find statistical estimates? So if I'm back in the statistical settings, say regression, all I'm going to do is just compile a list of 50 regression algorithms and just my estimator is just going to keep looking at all of my 50 results and just kind of aggregate them. That's correct. Or in fact, I don't know if you went to, a few weeks ago we had a talk by Peter Bartlett in the department. And he talked about the regression version of this. In fact, in that case, you really have infinitely many things, right? Because the betas form an infinite set. And yes, there's, that's exactly what he was doing, was he was basically aggregating the regression estimators as you go along. So yeah, it extends to regression. So when you're aggregating all those uh, regressions, actually, for those individual regressions, you're making some well, that's, that's an interesting point. Are these making assumptions? Well, this is just an algorithm. It just takes numbers in and outputs a number. So there is no assumption. But uh, let me rephrase your concern, which is, I think, a valid one, and is maybe the catch in all of this, which is all we're saying is we're doing well relative to the best of these. What if the best of these is doing badly? So. It, there is an assumption, at least for this to work well, which is that you're hoping that at least one of these is going to do well. It's going to be a decent predictor. Saying you're doing well relative to the best one when the best one's terrible is not very interesting. So there is kind of a hidden assumption, I guess, in all this, which is that at least one of these you know, is going to do OK. But in some sense, that's what we're always doing. right? When you do linear, high dimensional linear regression, you're hoping some regressor, linear regressor is going to do OK. Otherwise, you're kind of screwed. And so it's, it's in the same vein as that. You are just comparing yourself to a given set of estimators or algorithms. It's the regret that you're measuring. Yeah. Uh, so in practice, are there good ways for picking the experts? Or are you just kind of doing them up? Oh, no. So there's a whole, this is like, a, this is now why there's a huge number of people working on online uh, methods is, yes, there's, a, there's an enormous literature about how to actually do this. And I won't even attempt to, to go into it because I don't know enough about it. But like I said, we just had a talk a few weeks ago about actually doing this for regression and so on. But yeah, there's a very large literature about doing this. And of course, this is this particular version where there's no x's. This is just pure y's, which is why it's called individual sequence prediction. But there's versions of this with x's. And there's, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of stuff. There's also, by the way, a large literature about relating this to the way we've been thinking throughout the course, which is called batch prediction, where you just get a bunch of data and you have to predict a new observation. All of these online algorithms can be batchified. They can be turned into batch algorithms. And a lot of people like to do that because then you can prove things about classifiers and so on using completely different methods. Using You can transfer the results from online prediction into just ordinary prediction results fairly easily. In fact, I think I even included um, right near the end of that section five, you'll see I have something about batchification, for example. So it's also used as a mathematical technique to derive batch methods and to derive theorems about batch methods. So by the way, if you want to learn more about th this stuff, two really good uh, references I'll tell you about. There's this book by uh, Chesa Bianchi, Conconi, and Gentile, which is where I took uh, these notes essentially from, which is now maybe a little bit outdated because the field has been moving fast, but it's very nice. It's got a lot of the re really important key results. And then there's a book that's not out yet, but I think it's, you can get the notes for free online because it, Sasha Rocklin 
at Wharton has been teaching a course on this uh, for a number of years. And I think he still has his notes. So if you go to the Department of Statistics in the Wharton School, I think you'll see a course there about this. And I believe last time I checked, he had a PDF file, a kind of a book in the works. And his stuff is a little bit more statistical. In fact, a lot of his work is about making connections between the online world and the kind of stuff we learned about. Like he has sort of online versions of VC dimension and things like that. So those are two good references to look at. But of course, there's, there's tons of stuff. OK, so let's do, uh, let's see, we have, so maybe I won't go through the proof because that's a bit dry. But if you're curious how it works, you'll see, go through the proof because you're going to be surprised. It's only a page and a half long. And the surprising fact is, again, Hoofding's inequality comes into it. So somehow, even though it's not probabilistic, by rewriting things a certain way, it looks like a probability. And then you can use Hoofding's inequality. So it gives you a very elegant, short proof. It shows you that you can use probabilistic techniques even though there's no probabilities lurking around. All right, let's talk now. We, have, we don't have much time left. So let me judiciously pick uh, one more thing to talk about. Unless somebody wants to start arguing with me, which I was kind of hoping. Kevin's ready to go for it. Let's go. Well, I just had a question about the fragility thing. So oh, OK. Is there, so I'm still not quite sure how come if I just change the distribution, if I just deviate from normal a little bit, how come everything? Like, Don't think about the normal. Think about, uh, think a sparse linear vector and add epsilon to every zero. It's all of a sudden dense instead of sparse. There's, there's an example. Or more importantly, take an incoherent matrix and add a bit of correlation between two things. You'll never detect that for d very, very large because it changes the kolbeck lambda distance between the distributions by order 1 over d. And all of a sudden, from an almost uncorrelated matrix, you have, a highly you have two very highly correlated things, and you can't detect the difference. So it's more about the incoherence in lost uh, two, you know, you have x1 now and x10,000 highly correlated among a sea of 100,000 covariates. You're never going to find that. So the, di the distributional distance is tiny between those two things. But all of a sudden, you've completely broken the incoherence assumption. Or take the linearity assumption. In the space of all regression functions, it's not hard to find a function which is very nonlinear, but is very close to linear. Is it just the proof technique proof breaks down, or the algorithm itself just fundamentally spits out wrong answers? Every algorithm will spit out wrong answers. I claim there's no algorithm that does those things unless you do things like splitting the data. That's my claim. I, I, this is a conjecture, I should say. Okay. Um, all right, so we only have a few minutes left. I don't, I, maybe there's no time uh, to go into yet. Another one. Let me see, though, if there's other questions or comments. Because, again, I want to emphasize I'm, I'm being very opinionated here. Yes? So how do the problems, so like all of these problems come from dimensionality. So how would that apply to something like RKHS? <clears throat> well, so if we do, if we're doing, an, let's think of we're doing RKHS regression. This, there's two different notions of dimensionality. I think what you're thinking of is, well, we've moved, moved to an infinite dimensional thing. But if we only had a single x and a single y, you're right that when I regress uh, y and x using reproducing current Hilbert space up, I've gone to an infinite dimensional problem, but I'm still only estimating a single regression function. So it's really just non-parametric regression. And the dimensionality there isn't really hurting me in, in the sense that I'm still just estimating one run-dimensional run regression. What would but the problem would be if I wanted to do non-parametric regression on a huge number of these, that's the dimensionality that's going to kill me. So yeah, it's a little bit tricky because the, the, the word high dimension or phrase high dimension can come up in many different ways. And in some uh, circumstances, it's actually not hurting you so much. And in some, it is. But, yeah, but, but an RKHS by itself is not necessarily going to cause a problem just because it's infinite dimensional. We do a lot of infinite dimensional things. Any other? No one wants to argue with me that they do hard on these things? 
I would just emphasize once again that a, the notion of worst case performance is it's hard to understand whether that tells the whole story or not. Even the individual speaker tradition, because there's no distribution, you're left to, in a deterministic world, come up with some measure of performance, and usually it's worst case. Right. That was taking the max, for example, right. or all the ones. So that's often not, and even in other contexts, it's kind of clear that's not the right notion. Um, yeah, it is true that I've been talking here about taking the maximum or the worst, the worst case. There is this middle ground. There is a, there is, one of the hard things to say though is sometimes of course it's perfectly reasonable to make certain assumptions and a lot of this has to do with judgment and a lot of it has to do with the, the particular application you're working on and so on. But you do want to worry about when you make assumptions and this is something that I don't think we think about enough is when are my assumptions checkable? If I'm going to make assumptions, when does there exist a test for that assumption and a test with reasonably high power? It's not, you don't want to have a, a test which has very low power for an assumption because then you're going to have lots of data but low power. You're going to fail to reject the assumption and say, okay, therefore it's normal. Right? That, that would be an example. Because the problem with testing assumptions is that the default is to not reject when you don't have enough power. And that doesn't mean you've proved the assumptions correct. You just might not have enough power. So I, I, just a general thing to think about in your research is when you make assumptions, ask yourself, can I construct a test for this assumption, in particular a test with high power. There's a very interesting and very little known paper by David Friedman, you have to search for this on the web, about, I forget the title of it, but it's something about testing the assumptions in regression. And what he shows is that even in low dimensional regression, most of the assumptions people make, there is no test with any power for any of those assumptions. It's a very interesting paper. I should have included that in the references, but I don't know if I did. Okay, so I, I didn't get foaming at the mouth and so on. I, I should have gotten a little bit more riled up to get you guys excited. But think about what I said. And because uh, I do think it's important to make, you know, you're, you're the next generation of researchers and you'll either be the ones to stop everybody from using all these crazy assumptions or you'll keep using them. I don't know. But that'll be up to you guys. But anyway, it's food for thought, hopefully. And uh, that, so next week, Remember, we're going to have the, uh, the exciting conference with all the coffee and donuts or whatever it is that Ryan ordered, prizes, all kinds of exciting stuff's going to happen. But please remember to get your PDF things to the TAs as early as you can on Sunday so they have time to put everything together, make sure it all compiles. And please try to get the class on time because we're really you know, going to be tight for time. It'll be fun. All right? So we'll see you next week.